Welcome back to my lecture and uh, now I want to talk about um, two topics you have heard about this already, the FEMO physics and the BCPCS crossover, but now the view of an experimentalist, so I don't start with hyperspheric uh, representation of things, I uh, produce more simple pictures. Um, and um, so part five now of my lecture is about the paradigm of few body physics, the so-called Yefimov states. And the correct pronunciation is Yefimov, not Efimov states, it's Yefimov. Uh, and um, uh, now um, you have seen, actually this picture you have seen already somehow, but it's just a different representation a little bit. Um, now I plot here the 1 over scattering length scale, now the positive side is here. Here's the positive side, so where you get the Daimler state. <coughs> And we are in a universal range where A is very large. And uh, here is a scale, it looks a little bit complicated, but it's essentially on the, 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 the square root of an energy scale with the right sign that you had before for the energy. And the square root of a parabola uh, makes them a straight line. So this is the universal time state. Okay, and this is the representation that the theme of use in this uh, is, is early work. And uh, now, what about uh, this situation? We have here, above the threshold, the only thing that we can have is we can have an atom pair, or atom pairs. So two atoms now can exist as a pair, they have some uh, additional um, kinetic energy. Okay, then below this threshold and above that threshold, what we can have is a dimer, two atoms bound together, with some kinetic energy. So this is the dimer threshold here in this state, and if we have some kinetic energy, we are up here. So this is a two-body world. Very simple and exactly what you have seen before, just represented in a little bit different way to confuse you a little bit. Okay, um, now here below, there are all the two bound dimer states. So we have very large scattering things, so these are very weakly bound states, and there are all the other vibrational levels, they are way down, I don't know, on this scale, maybe thousands of meters down, there are, uh, there are the other states. So, um, and uh, now from this two-body picture, I just want to go to the three-body picture. Let me just add an, one atom. Here we go. So now, this is the three-body continuum. This is now the atom dimer continuum, where I can have a dimer and an atom, and some additional kinetic energy. Still I have very deep, below I have to have deeply bound states. And here I have a region which is empty at the moment. What, what can happen here? I can have trimal states. Okay, and this was a situation considered by uh, Yefimov. And he found trimal states, these ones, not only one, but an infinite series of trimal states. Yeah, these are the states and they connect here on this region of negative scattering lines, it's a triatomic uh, system to the triatomic threshold here, to the atom dimer threshold here. Okay, and what is so remarkable about these states is there uh, is this infinite series. I could only plot it in the finite way, I've plotted five states, but there is a principle uh, an, an infinite number of these states. Uh, and I also have also reduced, so this is the scaling factor Dirt has mentioned already, the thing is 22.7. I have artificially reduced it to a factor of 2. Okay, otherwise it's very hard to call it. Um, okay, and uh, so these are now the, uh, the states. And this is the Fumo's original drawing um, from a 1970 paper of a nuclear physics journal. And it says that this is spectrum um, the level spectrum of three um, uh, particles um, which don't have spin. Particles, not neutral particles without spin. Uh, as spin. And this is now his representation of this series. Okay, let me uh, get back to my uh, drawing, which is essentially the same. And one thing is that these trimer states, they are in this halo world. These are these. Quantum halo states I've introduced before, not a two-body, but a three-body halo state. Um, at least in that region, there is a very strong halo character. Um, then, um, the famous scaling law. Um, here, this is an inverse length scale, and this K, as it was defined, is also now an inverse length scale. Everything is now inverse length. 
That means I can start in the center of this block, draw a radial line in some direction. I can draw it at threshold or in any direction. I can draw it in long K scale or in any direction. And they always get now this scaling, this discrete scaling behavior with a factor of 22.7. And this is known as the FEMOS radial law. Um, with a discrete scaling invariance following the factor of 22.7. Okay, what else? This is a region where trimers exist, but no weakly bound dimers. And Lerbe has already explained this in terms of these Borromian rings. Yeah, um, so a system which um, is bound with, um, if you have three uh, different objects, then it's a bound system, but if you take one away, the remaining two, they are not bound. So this is called the Borromean region. And what else? Bert has also mentioned the resonance points when the states so, so hit the threshold or merge with the threshold here, we get triatomic resonances and here so-called atom dimer resonances. And um, what happens there, something that happens there is it opens up the K-channel. So what happens here, so the collide three particles collide at very, very low collisional energy. They form a Nifimo state temporarily, but this opens up the decay channels to more deeply bound states. Um, and, and then it causes loss. Um, and so these triatomic resonances lead to uh, resonant loss features in, uh, in an atomic quantum gas. And this is the observable that we have in the experiments. Here on the atom dimer side, it's similar when we create an atom dimer mixture we can observe decay, and there are some other features on the atomic side, if I create an atomic sample here, where you see a few more physics shows up in three body recommendations. But these resonance graphs are the most striking uh, features. Okay, so here I've shown this illustration already, three body decay, I've shown this equation already, the A to the 4 dependence, and then there's the coefficient C. And the coefficient C, it's, an, it's just a number, but it's a number that depends on the scattering length in this way, in a log periodic way. So whenever I increase the scattering length by a factor of 22.7, I get the same number again. And here, here this periodicity shows up, and this is how we can see the field of physics. Here is what you need as an experimentalist, a lab with many components there. This is our first season lab, there we will observe the the FEMO states somewhere in the center of this mess is the vacuum chamber where we can produce cesium atoms in a actually near degenerate gas at a temperature of 10 microkelvin, sometimes even below, uh, and we come down to 4 micro, four, sorry, not micro, nanokelvin, of course, 10 nanokelvin, and um, so sometimes even a little bit below. And this is very important because if you want to have a large thermal degrading wave things, not too large, because we don't want to have a condensation. Uh, condensation we don't want to have because it's negative scattering length and the condensate will collapse. So all these experiments are, are made in a, in a, in a um, gas close to the condensation, uh, and, and um, our most of our experiments are negative um, scattering length. Um, and so cesium has some very nice features, an really interesting Fishbrook resonance structure. And, um, the early experiments where we did were in the low field region. So this is the lowest state where no two-body decay can happen. And you see a range which looks small here, but it's already a rather large tuning range from minus 2,000 up to well, plus 1,500 more. Um, this is already a very good tuning range. And in this tuning range, we found the first female feature. Later, we upgraded our magnets yeah, and we could produce now fields now of close to one kilogram, so we could exploit this resonance. And this is now the world record holder in uh, strength or broadness of the resonance. This is the super entrance channel dominated resonance we could use for the experiments. And this makes the situation quite comfortable and clean. So, this is the resonance that we use in the experiments. Then there are many other narrower Fishbach resonances which have all here. Um, um, neglected, we, we know them all, and if you want to have details, I'm just looking at this paper. So, but I want to show the main results. 
Here is the first observation of a diffeme of resonance at the low field region. Here the scale is uh, scattering mean scale, it's negative, it's positive. On the negative side at around minus 900, war value, frankly, is resonantly enhanced loss feature. And that's the first diffeme of resonance seen in the experiments. And uh, then you ask the question, or you ask many questions about this. But I just want to ask the question, can we see this second resonance? And the second resonance needs then, this is minus 9,000 times 20, roughly, it means something like minus 20,000 more. And we have to find a way how to do this in a very controlled way and, and so on. But finally, we could, we, could, we could do it, and we could really <coughs> observe the second, um, a second, um, if you know, feature. Near these, uh, the resonance position really was about minus 20,000 A naught. And um, this really needed, I mean, this is not still somehow temperature limited, and uh, we needed also description taking final temperature effects into account. And this was actually developed in, uh, in, uh, in Paris and related to experiments on uh, the DCM 7 uh, system and large scatterings. What people have uh, talk talked about related things, yeah, but Certainly a large, uh, about large scatterings, not about this one. And, um, and here, actually, we could identify the second feature and we could expect a scaling factor uh, from the experiment, which is 21.0 plus minus 1.3, um, which is um, close to the 22.7, a little bit below, and we believe that this little bit below, it's not um, just a random deviation, there's physics in it, because the if you move seeing scenario, I mean, it needs really the limit of very large scattering rings. The lowest resonance is maybe a factor of nine uh, higher than the, than the Van der Waals range, so there are still some corrections to this. We think there is physics in this little uh, definition. So I just want to make the remark that we also observe that the resonances in various experiments, but there the physics is a little bit more complicated because you have to know exactly the character of the molecular state. But these, I think, are the main um, observations. And um, now let me look into my length scale diagram again. Um, the R lambda bars here, the tunable A, then lambda, which is a little bit smaller than L, meaning we need the general gas. And uh, now one question is where do we find the first state? Is it just um, random or determined by very short range physics? We have talked about this already, that's related, it's a question of the three body parameter. Actually, it turned out that for these atomic systems um, with the Van der Waals uh, interaction, there's a kind of universality that you always find the first state at about uh, minus 9.5 times R Van der Waals. That's the, uh, the, the <coughs> experiment. So it has been shown experimentally. All the systems investigated so far show this kind of uh, universality. And it's understood because the and the rapid increase of the Van der Waals inter uh, interaction somehow reflects the wave function. It doesn't penetrate too much into the inner region, and therefore only this Van der Waals range is uh, relevant. So this is called the Van der Waals uh, <coughs> universality, which is unique to this atomic system, nuclear system, a different story because of short range uh, interactions. Then if you want to see the next state, it's somewhere around 200 times the R Van der Waals, which is really huge. And so it's, it's very difficult to get there. And um, you find that was the case in our experiment. Different lengths, similar length scales for thermal effects. And also, if you get close to the degeneracy condition, actually something else happens. You get increasing effects of higher order cluster states. Let me first I mean, summarize some experimental observations. Um, and so the three identical boson system has been investigated with, with cesium, Innsbruck, potassium uh, 39 in Florence, uh, lithium 7 in, in, uh, in uh, Rice, Thailand, and also related experiments in, in Paris, and, uh, and uh, rubidium 85 at, um, at, at, at Gila. Uh, and um, so spin mixture deferments is a special system where you have non-identical particles, but they all show uh, pairwise almost resonant interactions by, uh, to my best knowledge, three groups, um, the Heidelberg group, I mean, uh, the Zillian School at Penn State University, the University of Tokyo, uh, and um, 
that's a kind of special system which uses the properties of the Mithu 6 system that everything is almost resonant. And um, then um, another system, mixtures of different species by, by several groups. Um, and um, and uh, just one to point to maybe the most extreme system in, in terms of mass imbalance, this <coughs> and, and cesium, uh, which has been investigated in Heidelberg and Chicago. And I think we'll hear a talk by Matthias Weidemüller on Wednesday on this. And this is particularly interesting because for systems with large mass imbalance, the FM of period gets smaller. And in this case, the FM of period shrinks from 22.7 to 4.8. And this gives us a possibility really to observe not only two states, but three, two periods and, uh, and, and, and their behavior. This has really been an important advance. But you will hear about this on, on Wednesday. But now, OK, and this is another picture I want to show. Alert has shown it already. Um, this is. Um, I mean, the Yefimo states, are, that's a long story. And, um, and uh, many years ago, I don't know exactly when, uh, long, uh, a search for Yefimo states in, uh, in helium molecules has, uh, has started. I mean, there was Peter Turnius with many experiments. And, um, and, uh, and um, so this was a long story. And now only maybe two years ago, this story now ended successfully by a new, new kind, new method to image these states. And that's actually, so um, uh, the group of Reinhard Dörner, they, um, Dörner was um, uh, also collaborating on this um, with, uh, with a group. They, they created their heating beams under certain conditions. They found out what is a good production condition. They create these trimers and then rip off the rip, uh, rip off the electrons immediately and then monitor the Coulomb explosion of the system. And then you see that these trimer stages form. This is a heroic experiment which I like very much and which also shows a little bit that, I mean, um, so the molecular community has essentially given up on these states. Then came the cold atoms, and we could show the theme of resonance that the states are there. And this renewed the interest in the whole field. I think it also triggered, um, I mean, contributed a little bit to triggering also this kind of research with new methods, uh, which was finally uh, successful. I think it's a very nice story. Okay, now um, the universal free body scenario I've shown already several times, but I promised you to say something about n body states. So now it's about the n-body states. I start with the three-body scenario, and now I ask what happens when I add another particle. Um, and um, now I have four atoms, and this becomes now the four atom threshold. And um, here I have the um, um, uh, a dimer state plus two atoms, and this new line is the threshold of two dimers. And here two dimers uh, uh, can, can, can exist with some kinetic energy. And actually, it turns out that now you find new states, four-body states. And here I illustrate a pair of four-body states, which is associated to the Yefimov state. It has been shown that there is a universal relation. If you know the Yefimov state, you know this pair of four-body states. And there is not only one pair of these four-body states, there is an infinite series. So each every uh, Yefimov state has um, associated to it a pair of these four body states. Uh, and uh, this is now um, a kind of an established situation. Uh, and um, so it was a challenge to check this experimentally. And um, a couple of years ago, we carried out an experiment on cesium, looking actually now on a resonance points on the four atom threshold where you see a resonant four body recombination. Okay, so resonant four-body recombination. And actually, we found out, so this is a loss signal. So this is increasing loss as a function of the scattering length. And this maximum, this is where we have the three-body resonance. But we found another resonance, which sits here. We could also show that it's four-body character because it follows the four-body loss equation. And this little bump is now the four-body uh, resonance. It's an observation of four-body recombination. And we saw also traces of the other state, which is shown uh, here in this, uh, uh, in this situation. And uh, so this, um, the position of these resonances fitted very nicely into the predicted uh, scenario and the universal relations. But this was not the end of the story. 
I mean, you can ask if now I now have four body states, how about five body states, six body, n body states. And this was is a question uh, looked at by Javier von Stecher in a theoretical paper. And he predicted that the story continues. And you have also five body states and six body states and general n body states associated to these uh, Efimov states. And that was a challenge for us experimentally. So this is a figure from a joint uh, paper on the negative A side uh, of this scenario, where we have the trimer states, we have the tetramere states, and we have the pentamere states. And we looked into recombination features, and we could see three-body recombination, four-body, and the little bump, which was reproducible in the experiments, indicated five-body recombination. So, okay. So we didn't make any attempt to look into six or seven body recombination. We think that now showing that this exists, the four and five body, we have reason to believe that this general theory on N body cluster states might be correct. Okay, so this is the story of the N body states, and then I want to show this photo taken in 2009 when Vitaly Yefimo visited us in Innsbruck. He's in the lab now, so this is our cesium apparatus, and um, I mean, this was really a very great moment, and I have to say that, I mean, his name really stands for the paradigm of ultra-cold few body physics. Okay, coming now to the next part, uh, the BC-BCS crossover and the unitary Fermi gas, some um, experimentalists use. So we start, that is the famous spin mixture of lithium-6 atoms, so we go to high magnetic field and we produce two fermions in different magnetic substates. And this is the prime candidate now for, for many experiments, used in many labs now. Lithium-6 is particularly stable, much more stable than potassium-40, um, and uh, it's with real um, advantages. And um, then you get a broad Feshbach resonance. I've introduced the resonance already. It's a strongly entrance channel dominated resonance, first predicted almost 20 years ago. The most accurate uh, calcula uh, characterization comes from Seelings group uh, now, and now the position, the resonance position, is known. It's a few hundred Gauss wide resonance, and it's known with a hundred milli Gauss um, precision. The resonance center. It's really amazing. So we have something. We know the tunability of the system extremely well, and um, that's the point I made already. The resonance is strongly entrance channel dominated. Now, uh, the Feshbach resonance and the strongly interacting regime. Now I want to go to strongly interacting conditions. What does it mean? In the Fermi gas, in the degenerate Fermi gas, let's say T equals zero gas, you have a typical energy scale, which is the Fermi energy. And you can associate a length scale to it, which is one over the Fermi wave number, one over Kf. This is the length. You get it from this expression. And this is with a prefactor of 0.27, the length scale L I defined before. But we like to use this 1 over Kf. Now um, I can define an interaction parameter, dimensionless interaction parameter, which is 1 over Kfa. And this interaction parameter is uh, dimensionless. And the system is strongly interacting if this parameter, the modulus of this parameter, is smaller than 1. Okay, and in this plot, now let me just consider typical conditions. Let's say Fermi energy of 1.5 microkelvin, and then I get uh, 1 over Kf, which is close to 4,000 Bohr radii, and then the situation looks like this. Look at the two horizontal dashed lines, so, and uh, then you see strongly interacting in this regime, according to this definition of uh, strongly interacting. Of course, there's no sharp, very sharp definition where exactly it begins to be strongly interacting, but you have to come up with some um, reasonable criterion. So that's the uh, most interesting regime, the strongly interacting um, regime. But I want to draw your attention to another regime, which is this one here, which is on the, uh, on the side of the resonance, on the positive A side of the resonance, where we have a molecular bound state. And uh, this is the regime where we form these halo dimers. The criterion is scattering length needs to be larger than the van der Waals range, much larger. And it should be mm, smaller or about the same uh, um, magnitude as 1 over Kf to this parameter for the interparticle distance. And this is shown here. And this is a regime where I can form uh, weakly bound dimers. 
both and um, if I put two fermions together, it's clear I, I get a boson. And uh, now the collisional decay of halo dimers, that's something very interesting and that's also uh, where few body physics comes into play and Dörte has explained this uh, um, already. Um, when this happens, I mean these two halo dimers collide, um, then could in principle happen that um, you create a more deeply bound dimer and two free atoms with a lot of kinetic energy trap loss. And this is what happens if I do it, let's say, with cesium in a halo state near the broad resonances. Then I get uh, strongly increased losses. But if I do this with the fermions, it's a totally different situation. There's Pauli blocking uh, in this game, and the collisional decay is very strongly uh, suppressed, and it, you, you get an extremely stable situation. And um, so you, you need two ingredients. First of all, you need this halo type wave function. Um, for the for the colliding atoms, and then you need the Pauli suppression that you have a pair of uh, non-identical particles. This works for dimer-dimer collisions and for atom-dimer. So this is another beautiful example of few-body physics. Okay, now this just shows a gallery of the first molecular Bose-Einstein condensates, the first three experiments where um, one could achieve uh, molecular Bose-Einstein condensation, Innsbruck, Gila, and at, uh, at MIT, uh, Innsbruck and, and MIT work with lithium-6, and at uh, Gila, uh, the Begins group with potassium, uh, here the molecular uh, condensate. And this was a starting point for a very exciting time, so then really things accelerated, and now the question was what happens now if you tune the interaction, if you change now your interaction, you get your molecular condensate as a starting point, in our case, and, uh, and, uh, and then you, you have it as a starting point for, uh, for, for uh, tuning the interaction. I want to show this slide here. Um, with a molecular condensate, I'm somehow in the world of bosons. I have my uh, dimers, and these dimers condense. Okay, on the other side of the resonance, I would have the world of fermions, and if, this is, if they are cold enough, then they would be pairing something like Cooper pair formation on the Fermi surface. Okay, and this looks like two different worlds. It looks like as if there was a wall in between, but there is no wall in between. We find that it's con these two situations are smoothly connected. There's a continuous connection, and this can be experimented, explored by just variation of the scattering length here in this way. Okay, and then just want to show this slide, an early crossover experiment in Innsbruck, early 2004. Um, and, um, and what we measured is just the size of the, of, the, of the trap cloud. And you see in the molecular BC case, it's rather small, and when you get to resonance, it gets bigger, and then it reaches some more or less constant value. But this is also the scattering things doesn't change too much here. And actually, we can look at the resonance point, and we can extract... So, but this is not, not, not really, not really accurate. So we got a kind of a first estimate, um, for, for the Birch parameter, which was in, in this experiment, if you look at this 0.3 with a large, um, error bar. Um, and this was on the Birch parameter. Actually, the group of John Thomas has a similar result on expanding systems. And also at the ENS Paris, they looked into, uh, strongly interacting Fermi gases, measuring interaction energy, which is sort of related uh, to that. And um, so this is the famous picture from uh, Debbie Jean's group, the formation of the condensate, of the, um, of the first so-called fermion condensate, and there the experimental procedure was a little bit uh, different um, because they produce a, um, a fermionic condensate on the side of negative scattering lengths and then uh, apply a very fast projection technique to look at the uh, condensed fraction at the other side of the resonance. But this works for this specific system um, uh, quite well. can also be more or less implemented for the uh, lithium-6 uh, system. But there, the, here it's an advantage to have a narrower resonance because you can sweep faster. Okay, so these are early BEC-BCS crossover experiments. And now I come uh, a few minutes to the unitary Fermi gas. Now the question is, you are exactly on resonance. A gets goes to infinity. And what is this situation? It's the strongest possible interaction that quantum mechanics allows between the two particles. Uh, and we have the interesting situation that A, in this case, drops out of the problem at a length scale. 
and that's the uh, unitary Fermi gas. Here in my length scale representation, it looks like this. I get the, um, uh, the A uh, here, the variable A, and here I have the situation 1 over Kf, the length scale, and lambda, so this is a degenerate Fermi gas already, and now I can increase A, and then I get a strongly interacting degenerate Fermi gas, still with some finite temperature effects. I can also tune A to infinity, and then I get the situation that only the 1 over Kf matters, or the length scale, and if I have thermal effects, still a little bit the lambda. And uh, here, let me stay for a moment with this situation with two parameters, 1 over Kf and lambda. I have only two parameters, and I have one global length scale, and I can write down another parameter, for example, 1 over Kf lambda, which then is an interesting variable for universal thermodynamics um, um, of, the, of the system. And um, I hope that you further you will cover some more of the universal of the thermodynamics of the system because it's a very extremely interesting uh, topic. Now, um, length scales. Now, in the extreme situation, zero temperature limit and the degenerate Fermi gas with unitary interaction. There's only one parameter in the game. It's kind of a global parameter. The size of the gas can be um, more dense or less dense um, and have a different interparticle spacing, but the physics stays exactly the same. There's no difference in the physics. And the situation fully characterized by one length scale only, essentially the same situation as we get it in a non-interacting T equals zero uh, Fermi gas. And then you may ask, but what then, if I only have this one parameter, what is then the role of interactions? What, the, what, what can interaction do? That's the question. And the answer is relatively simple. The only thing that can happen, let's now consider a homogeneous system in a box-like potential. You have the chemical potential at t equals zero, which is the Fermi energy for a non-interacting gas. And if you have an interacting gas, the only thing that can happen is rescaling. You get a lower chemical potential, something like this. This is the chemical potential of the resonant gas, and this does not depend on the, 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 the value of these chemical potential. It can be much larger, but the rescaling always follows the same factor. And this again, this is now the, this, the, the, this Birch factor, where have the chemical potential on resonance is this factor, this parameter Xi, times the chemical potential for a non-interacting system. That's the basic idea. That's a universal number, the Birch parameter. Sounds very fundamental. Uh, and uh, it's uh, because also it connects to things like neutron star physics. Actually, in the crust of a neutron star, you have such a system of spin up, spin down particles with a resonant, almost resonant interaction. And uh, it's a very challenging many body problem uh, to uh, get to this parameter. And now it's a very nice that now the experiments on the Fermi gases and advances in theory have mutually stimulated each other. And now that to a no, we now know this Birch parameter, and I think theory experiment agrees with I think three digits or less than percent uh, precision now. It's really amazing. And um, yeah, what is a simple way to measure this parameter? Simple, uh, but of course it only works if you have a t equals zero system. Uh, then uh, what happens actually? You can show that the system shrinks. Um, so this is the shrinking of the size in the trap, and the spatial shrinking is proportional to the fourth root of, of theta. So if you measure the shrinking, you get a relatively large error bar on that, that we will be did in the first experiments on the, on the crossover. But now there are better ways to do it in the experiment, or also taking into account finite temperature um, uh, effects. And this connects now to measurements of the equation of state. There have been several experiments um, um, uh, related to the equation of state of the system, uh, and also early work, I think now, it, it, it was in 2010 from the ENS Paris, also from Duke University, University of Tokyo, and I think now the state-of-the-art measurement now in the field is the measurement from MIT, the Zwierlein Group, on the equation of state, and um, I don't want to go into details here, it's, it's too complicated, but I just want to say that um, you have some universal function which here you have the chemical potential over the thermal energy, and this is the number density over the uh, number density without interaction, but you can express it in uh, various different ways. And the red line here, these is, are experimental results. So these are experimental results. The other things are various theoretical results. 
and I want to point to yeah, the Birch parameter, which comes out of this experiment now with a percent uh, accuracy. I also want to point to something else, which is this. There seems to be some kind of discontinuous, discontinuous behavior. Goes up here as a straight line, but then something happens. Yeah, what is going on here? Actually, this is the situation where the gas is cold enough to get superfluid. And superfluidity has studied and the Fermi gas, I just want to point to two uh, results. One is the uh, nice observation of vortex lattices at MIT in 2005. Before we had some evidence on superfluidity, for example, from collective mode measurements and low damping. Um, but this experiment made it crystal clear. I mean, you have the vortex lattice here, and this, uh, this uh, unambiguously shows uh, superfluidity. Uh, in the system in the crossover range. This is on resonance on the molecular side and on the uh, PCS side of the resonance. And one experiment we carried out a um, couple of years later is uh, on the observation of second sound. So second sound is a phenomenon in a superfluid which comes from the two fluid nature. You have the superfluid component and the thermal component and there you can have the propagation of a density wave. This is shown here. And here's the propagation of an entropy wave, uh, which we observe here. And from that, actually, one could deduce um, something for measuring the sound speed. You can, having some theoretical support, which we got from the Stringari group in Trento, then um, we, you can um, extract the superfluid fraction, which is also a very important many-body quanti quantity, which is very, very hard to calculate. And that's, that's a nice example how we can really come up in an experiment with some measurement and stimulate now hopefully also theoretical progress at these designs. And this is the nice thing in our field that you have this close interaction theory and experiment and new experimental results stimulate new theory. A theory then can make other suggestions, come up with new problems. And this is very nice in our whole field. Okay, now the last part. I think I have a few minutes left. I only need a few minutes. Just want to flash a few topics um, here. Okay, so um, um, a few topics uh, of, of interest. Um, there are many interesting developments going on um, with uh, at um, uh, quantum gases at very large scatterings. One example is the uh, unitary Bose gas. So what happens when you take a gas of bosons and you go to infinity? Are you going to talk about this? Uh, the unitary Bose gas things. Okay, that's another interesting uh, subject. I uh, have no slide on this, but it's also very interesting. And um, just want to make a few points. One thing is, and this connects to Dirtus talk, I mean, I start with a very large system, but now what happens if I introduce a trap size, which becomes relevant? Then I get the harmonic oscillator length, and these harmonic oscillator lengths, in particular in a lattice or in micro traps, becomes relevant and changes the whole problem. And this can happen in 3D, this can happen in, in the lower dimensionality, and this connects now to regimes of low dimensional or even mixed dimensional um, systems. And the other th length scale I can introduce is, you have an idea what, what, what else I can introduce as a new length scale? Yeah, so dipole-dipole interaction. So if I have a dipole-dipole interaction in the system, I can introduce a, a length scale, which is given here. And um, this can lead to new phenomena. It makes the situation anisotropic and has uh, uh, new effects. And here's one example from uh, Francesca Fallaino's group in Innsbruck on, uh, the, uh, on, the, on the droplet formation in such a quantum mass. And I think we will also hear a talk about this on this conference. Um, okay. So two new length scales and the problem. Another thing I want to quickly mention, so we find that uh, um, strongly repulsive systems are very interesting. You will hear a talk tomorrow on the Florence group. Uh, Matteo is here and talk about this, um, um, uh, about um, creating anti, uh, so, so um, repulsive Fermi, Fermi systems uh, which kind of an anti ferromagnetism where uh, the two spin components repel each other. And this also connects to a very fundamental problem in condensed matter physics, the stoner problem. And I think from this experiment we get some new insight on these problems. So this is for tomorrow then, more details. Strongly repulsive states, we also work on this in a mixture of fermions and bosons in Innsbruck. 
for bosons of potassium-41, fermions of lithium-6, and we observe a very clear phase separation, and we find a way now how to probe the remaining overlap of the two species at the interface between the two phases. And I think this connects now to yeah, physics at the interface, and I think this is also a new interesting uh, direction on where you need large scattering links. Uh, this is yeah, polaron physics, uh, two examples, Innsbruck work on Fermi polarons and Aarhus work on Bose polarons. Uh, we'll hear about both the experiments on this conference. Uh, and um, this is the situation now where we have, uh, yeah, in the limiting case, one single particle immersed in the Fermi C and then having very strong interaction with the Fermi C here and with the Bose condensate here in the uh, Aarhus work. It shows some similarities, but there are also very intriguing differences between uh, these situations. We'll hear more about this. And then one more topic of interest. I just want to advertise our new um, experiment and, and machine. We have set up um, this prosium-potassium mixture experiments in Innsbruck with a motivation to study imbalanced fermion mixtures. And uh, this is also uh, very interesting. You again need a large scattering length and um, it connects to few body physics. So this drawing shows as a function of the mass ratio between the two species, uh, the kind of states that can occur. And it's known that in a Fermi-Fermi mixture, if you have two identical heavy particles and one light particle, above a critical mass ratio of 13.6, you can again get Yefimov states. This is very interesting on its own right, but it's also something which creates losses. Therefore, in the new experiments, we don't want to explore this one, but we want to go to intermediate mass ratios. There are also interesting things going on, like uh, formation of the so-called katafzich malurich trimer at 8.2 mass ratio, and below that, we are with a mixture of lithium-potassium and disposium-potassium. We believe that this is a very interesting region for, um, uh, for new superfluid states, in particular, the, the imbalance here. So this few body physics is a nice example um, that the imbalance becomes relevant. So if I change this and I have two light particles and heavy one, nothing happens here you know, on the other side. So the system is intrinsically um, asymmetric. And this could lead to, to interesting new effects in superfluidity. And that's, so to say, the goal of these new experiments. And uh, we hope to be able to present more uh, very soon. I think we have a poster on this here on the uh, on the conference reporting on the current state of the experiment. Now, and this brings me to my conclusion. The conclusion is very short. I just want to point out ultra-cold atoms are uh, uh, yeah, from few body to many body physics, the main theme of this conference. It's a very interesting and exciting research field with many new opportunities to get great results. And enjoy the conference. Thank you.